Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on using the lab for more than just bone anatomy. My name is Adam Kiska, and I am the Life Sciences Marketing Manager here at Cengage. Before Hillary begins, I'd like to turn it over to Nanette from HAPS to say a few words. Hello, all. Welcome. My name is Nanette Tomachek, and I am your Eastern Regional Director uh, representing HAPS today. Um, I'm very excited um, to uh, talk about HAPS partnership with Cengage. Um, this has been really exciting. We had a great webinar last week um, with Liz Ko uh, talking about reproductive um, anatomy and physiology. We're going to hear about bone physiology this week. And next week, uh, we've got one more seminar on immunology. Um, other HAPS events that we have coming up. Um, don't forget about the central uh, regional meeting and the western regional meeting. Um, communications are coming out about those taking place very soon here later in October. Uh, the central meeting is on the 22nd and the western meeting is on the 29th. And then also don't forget about um, our HAPS town halls. Uh, those are members events. The HAPS educator town hall is actually taking place on October 14th. So come by if you want more information about publishing in the educator. And then don't forget about the uh, regional director town halls hosted by myself and the three other regional directors. Um, we're gonna do a professional development series. So we look forward to seeing you at the next um, Let's Chat uh, with the regional directors session on uh, Monday, November 7th. And with that, I'll turn it back to um, Adam at Cengage. Thank you so much. And I am going to now turn it over to Hillary. Hillary, please take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, before I even get started, I am going to admit that I am not a professional Zoom operator. So I'm always impressed with meetings where the presenter is just doing a million things at once. So I'm going to do my best. But if things get glitchy or uh, not computer glitchy, but just me glitchy. Um, please give me a little bit of grace and uh, we'll see how this goes. So first of all, um, hello everyone. Good morning to those of you that are still in the morning like I am and good afternoon, good evening, if you're coming from somewhere else in the world. My name is Hilary Angabretson and I teach at Whatcom Community College, which is in Bellingham, Washington. And that is in the very far, uh, west corner of Washington State. I'm about a half an hour from the Canadian border and about an hour and a half from Seattle, if you want to sort of place me in the world. Uh, Washington, Whatcom Community College is a mid-sized community college. I've been teaching here for over 20 years. And um, like many of you that are teaching at community colleges, I have a wide range of student variety. Uh, I've got students in high school, students coming directly out of high school, and then I've got a lot of returning students as well. And uh, I think uh, even those of you who might have more of a traditional student body, I really hope that you get a lot out of this presentation. I think it works for a huge range. These ideas work for a huge range of students. Before we jump in, uh, I just wanna kind of give you a sense of what my goals are for this presentation, things that I hope uh, are uh, shared goals with all of you as well. Um, I definitely want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the physiology of bone matrix construction. Uh, not that I think you all don't know about that, but I feel like it's kind of a nice place to start to sort of just begin all on the same with the same sort of conceptual understanding of what's going on there. And it allows us to sort of refer back to that as we, we think about how do we represent that to our students. Also want to work with you. I'm going to share with you where my students struggle with uh, physiology of bone. And I'm really curious to hear from uh, the group in here about where your students struggles are. I want to share with you my fun little bone matrix representation, uh, fun in the lab on the cheap, if you want to think of it that way, and then talk about how uh, we can use this representation. Uh, we can use it as a demo um, in the lab. We can also use it as a demo in the classroom. It's one of the things I really like about this one is it doesn't really require a wet lab if you just want to show uh, this uh, representation to your students. And then there are all sorts of fun ways to sort of just go down all the rabbit holes of uh, possible critical thinking exploration that we can challenge our students with. Um, lots of different possibilities here. And so I also wanna work on that with all of you. 
Uh, as um, I thought about this presentation today, I thought about how I traditionally teach in the classroom, and I usually ask my students to get pretty comfortable uh, resp responding to questions I pose. I'll just yell out questions into the classroom, and um, we'll get a really interactive conversation going there. And I also ask my students to ask relevant questions as they come up. And I thought about how I would replicate that here in the Zoom environment and was thinking about how it's so easy for people to end up talking over each other. I find that I'm always accidentally talking over my colleagues when I'm on Zoom with them. And I think the more bodies you get in the room, uh, possibly the more talking over that happens. And so instead, as Adam mentioned, we've got a couple of different um, ways to interact with each other to try and keep that, uh, that under control. So if you've got um, questions that, that are coming up, uh, please put them, use that Q&A button for that. Uh, again, as Adam mentioned, there'll be a couple of places where I'm pausing and um, checking in with folks to see if there are questions. But also as I um, post questions to you uh, and we're looking for that sort of back and forth conversation, I'd really like to see that happen in the chat. So there'll be a couple of places where I'll ask you um, to, to answer a question for me. And I will try and remember to remind all of you um, that the that you can just pop those answers into the chat so that we can kind of just see this rolling feed of answers from folks in the chat as we go. All right, so let's dive in and see what we've got going on here. So let's uh, first just kind of talk about that background of the physiology of bone construction. And of course, you all know that it's the osteoblasts that are our major bone forming cells. And they make bone with a, sort of a two pronged approach. I talk to students about uh, when I ask them about what osteoblasts do, they should always be thinking that they've got to tell me two things about what osteoblasts do. And they form bone with these two continual actions. Uh, they secrete the osteoid and they attract mineral salts to encrust that osteoid. And then I'd like to dive down into that um, because I think there's some really interesting things to keep in the back of our head as we think about um, what those two little phrases actually mean when we describe them to our students. So osteoid is mainly type one collagen and there are two genes that the osteoblasts are accessing to uh, build that collagen. Uh, they build alpha one and alpha two chains of type one collagen. And then in that extracellular space around them, the chains are assembled into a triple helix. And if you're a science nerd, like I know all of you are so dear to my heart, uh, that triple helix is two alpha one chains and one alpha two chain. And I, I don't know why I love that tidy little geeky moment there. Um, and then those, those triple helix wound uh, assemblies, are then further bundled to create the larger collagen, collagen fibers so that you have um, wound fibers on wound fibers. And then the second component of what osteoblasts doing, when we talk about the osteoblasts attracting mineral salts to encrust the osteoid, I, I used to say to my students, they call over the mineral salts. And then it dawned on me that they weren't really understanding what I was saying. And I was being a little euphemistic and uh, about what the osteoblasts are able to do. And so what's happening there is that the osteoblasts are increasing the concentration of inorganic phosphate in the microenvironment right around those collagen fibers. And then they're simultaneously removing some mineralization inhibitors from the area. And so as they, um, as they create that uh, inorganic phosphate in that area and then remove any inhibition to mineralization, the phosphate begins to come out of solution and the calcium ions come out of solution and we end up with that uh, beautiful hydroxyapatite salt that is come out of solution and encrusted on those fibers. Now, what is it about the collagen fibers that really enhances that, uh, that act of the salts um, coming out of solution and, and creating those crystals? And it's still somewhat unknown, which is really kind of cool. And uh, there's been some hypothesis and the, the hypotheses about really what's happening there. And most of it revolves around the idea that there's a lot of structure that's created by the small spaces between the, um, the protein chain that make up the fibrils, uh, which are that the two alpha ones and the one alpha, he, alpha two chains. And then between the neighbor fibrils that are also twisted around each other, there's these teeny tiny little spaces. And those spaces are just the right size for those phosphate ions to fit and then begin seed the growing hydroxyapatite crystals. 
Um, and so I'm hoping as I'm describing that to you, you've got all these beautiful pictures in your head, you're picturing proteins, you're pre pre picturing salts. And uh, I think part of that comes from all of you being experts. You've thought about the kinds of proteins that make up the human body and how ions interact um, with each other and with other substances a lot as you've uh, taught human anatomy and physiology. And so being able to picture what I just described to you verbally is relatively, um, you're relatively comfortable doing that. And so with that in the back of your head, I wanna share with you my current approach and, and how I share this information now with my students, because I definitely don't go all the way down into that minutia I just went over with you. Um, I, I tend to stay a little bit more superficial. What I do ask them to do is before they come to class on the day that we're going to talk about what osteoblasts do in bone physiology, uh, ask them to pre-read the text and I'm giving them two specific sections of their text. I'm asking them to read that section that you all know and love in, in your a and text, whatever that happens to be, about the four types of bone cells. And then I'm also asking them to read the section of their text that describes uh, what bone matrix structure is, what the extracellular matrix is made of, that osteoid and mineral salt story that will be in your textbook. And then they come into class and hopefully they've actually done that pre-reading. I offer often um, force a quiz on them to make sure that they've at least uh, expended some effort there. Uh, so as they arrive to class, I expect them to already be thinking about this material and I ask them to work in small groups. I give them kind of an easy start. I give them uh, the list of the four bone cell types, and I give them a list of jobs that are being done, and then ask them to make some matches there so that they can make sure that they know who is doing what uh, in the bone physiology story. And then I pose a pair of questions to them that are definitely meant to be a little more difficult and meant to ask them um, to think about that bone matrix structure component of their reading. Um, I tell them, of course, we know that bones need to be hard and strong to support the body. And so I'm asking them what component of that bone matrix is providing that hardness. And then the flip question to that, which is bones also need to have some flexibility or some give, which is an idea that maybe the students haven't thought about before, but that a little bit of flexibility and give is actually helping those bones withstand the weight stress that they're under. And I ask them to think about what component of bone matrix is providing that flexibility. So, so I'm getting them to sort of think about that and puzzle through that. And then the final thing that I'm asking them to do is to work in small groups to apply uh, what they know now about what the bone cells do and what those two components of the matrix are providing um, to work through um, a bit of information about rickets or osteomalacia in adults. It's not a, it's not a true case study or anything like that, um, but I am asking them to sort of puzzle through um, if, if we've got this situation with rickets and I have to tell them why it's occurring um, what's going to happen as a result of that. And so I'm really wanting them to think about the fact that if the, if the individual isn't consuming enough um, mineral salts, calcium mostly, then they, we, it's going to be very difficult to create that very saturated microenvironment around uh, the osteoid, around the proteins, um, so that it, there's enough of it there to come out of solution and really encrust. And at some point in that class discussion, uh, I will probably have some images that I'm sharing with them. And so I might be um, sharing some image images such as these two. These are um, two that I pulled that I really, really like uh, for showing uh, the different kinds of bone cells and for attempting to show some action. Um, and I have to say that this is how I presented this material for many years. And I, I have a feeling that many of you are saying, oh yeah, I do something sort of similar to that. Maybe I go more in depth here. Maybe I do a little more lecture there, but it's really kind of the same sort of presentation. I think if you, if you swapped one of us for another in a classroom on this day, um, it would probably be very similar across the classrooms uh, that are represented here. Um, but I was feeling a little stuck by this approach. And one of the places I was feeling really stuck has to do with these images that I'm showing you. Um, and, you know, some of you might even be drawing these sorts of images on the whiteboard too. And I felt like for one thing, these images are static, right? They're not showing the, the progression of what's happening, which I, I think many of you probably felt frustrated by that. Um, in addition, these images aren't tangible, right? They're not things that students can hold or touch. And for some of our students, 
as soon as we take that tangibility away, they, they begin to feel a little bit lost. Um, and it's very difficult for them to picture these drawings as anything other than drawings. Um, it's hard for them to picture this being event, three-dimensional events uh, that are happening inside of her body. And then finally, the thing that I felt most frustrated about was that uh, these, these images don't show us Oh yes, the osteoclasts are adorable, I agree. I love the, when you can kind of see the personality of a cell in the way the artist has rendered them, <laughs> Juno, definitely. Um, I, I feel like they're not showing us what's happening at the level of the proteins and the mineral salts. And I have to be honest, if anyone can find an image uh, that an artist has drawn showing this, please tell me because I spent a lot of, a lot of time uh, looking for images that are bring us down below the cellular level and showing us the proteins, showing us mineral salts and cresting. And, and I couldn't find that representation. So that was a frustration. And um, this... I think comes out in where I was seeing my students struggle as well. So I was struggling in trying to present this information to them. And then this is what I was getting back from them. And so um, when I've posed money's point questions, which many of you are probably familiar with money's points, is just a way to ask students what's the thing that's feeling the most gray or muddy or you're most unsure about or you don't understand. Uh, these are the kinds of responses I would get. Students would say, I don't understand how an osteoblast becomes an osteocyte. So they might tell it to me, like, I don't understand what the name change is, but my feeling was, um, and, and this, this particular student kind of got into it a little bit more to help me sort of see what they're, they're really struggling. When did the osteoblast get into a lacuna? Uh, and you can see there that the student is sort of missing the way uh, the, the things are happening around the outside of them in the extracellular matrix. Um, students just sort of straight up saying, I don't understand how, what, when you tell me what osteoblasts do, how are they making bone? And then the best one that like so dawned on me that I was using some terms interchangeably and forgetting that the students might not know that I was being interchangeable in terms is saying, I don't get what osteoid is. And I found what I had been doing is saying osteoid, collagen fibers, and protein fibers. And I was using those three terms somewhat interchangeably to describe the events that were happening. And I realized that the students um, weren't, weren't really cueing in on that, that I was meaning those things interchangeably. And then of course, you can really see what's going on sometimes with ex exam responses. Um, when I would ask students a multiple choice question of what is bone made out of, and I gave them some options, including calcium, phosphate, collagen fibers, and water, sometimes I would get students that just would only pull out the word calcium. And I think that, you know, that's, there's a lot of misconceptions about what bone is, right? And I think that's where that's coming from. Um, but they're missing all those beautiful events of what that osteoblast is doing. And then also when I give them a little bit more of a critical thinking question and ask them to take what we talked about in rickets and turn it on its side and think about a different disorder in which it's not the salts that are in low supply, but the, the collagen fibers are the thing that is that we don't have enough of. Um, what, what's our problem? And I would get blank spaces or just uh, some BS, which you always know in uh, essay questions, students love to, if they don't know the answer, just kind of wax poetic about something to fill the space. And I'd, I'd get some of that as well. And so it, it um, and I, I really love all these visual images that y'all are sharing in the chat. These are the great kinds of things that we can try and draw analogies from. And I think What's great is that you guys are also going uh, in a direction that was really what drove me to this analogy. And so I would end up drawing this sketch and I hope you guys are just really blown away with my artistic capabilities here in this. I have to tell you that this is probably much better than what I usually draw on the whiteboard because this was on a piece of paper on a, on a, on a desk that I drew for to put into this presentation. Um, and so I sketch this out and as I'm sketching, I'm talking, I said, okay, here's this osteoblast. And if, yes, thanks, Wendy, I know it's spectacular. If, if this osteoblast is secreting these collagen fibers outside and I draw the wiggly lines and then I say, okay, now if we can um, create a really saturated environment right around these fibers, then the salts will begin to come out of solution and get all crusty all over this. And so this is kind of where I leave it. And so I'm wondering right now, um, as I, as I, 
pause for a moment and uh, you can see this little hand in the corner that is reminding me to take a breath and pause because I do tend to uh, uh, speak too quickly. Um, I, I'm curious if anyone is coming up with any uh, questions at the moment about um, what I do with my students in the classroom or um, the level at which I address it. Um, and you're welcome to put those in the Q&A um, if you want to and Adam will um, uh, speak up if there are questions that are popping into the Q&A at this point. Thank you, Hillary. I am not seeing any questions yet. Maybe we just want to give a pause for a brief little moment here to see if anyone is uh, furiously typing away. Sure. But, um, there was a question uh, that came through earlier that I did answer. And um, folks were asking a couple of times about the recording and uh, Terry at the top had uh, mentioned, and thank you, Terry, for doing this, that the recordings are available on the website right now. So uh, there is a HAPS link. I'm going to go ahead and repost that right now for everyone, should they be interested in seeing the recording from at least last week. Um, but I am not seeing any other Q&A right now. So I would say, Hillary, that uh, you can go, uh, go ahead and move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, I feel like maybe in a moment, all of you are going to think that I seeded the audience with Tracy and Juno's uh, comments in the chat, uh, because they may, in fact, be reading my mind. So um, as I thought about, you know, I was sketching this out on the board, it again reminded me that my students' main problem seemed to be with that smaller than a cell level um, of critical thinking. And so um, as I make this sketch on the whiteboard, um, I had this thought at that moment of this rock candy analogy that uh, Tracy and Juno brought up. And so in that lecture, when this first, when I, you know, you know how analogies that pop into your head and you just start barfing them out at your students, I said, well, it's like rock candy. And, and I, then I think I said something like, uh, when you're a kid, maybe you made rock candy and about a quarter of the class started vigorously nodding. And they were like, oh, yes, rock candy. And the other three quarters of the class were saying, well, what are you talking about? And so I started to then, this is how things devolve, right? I started to then be like, okay, well, rock candy. So you'd create a solution of water and you'd put so much sugar into that water that the sugar was, the, the water couldn't hold any more sugar. It was as dissolved as it could get uh, under boiling. And then you can hang a string into that water. And then I got more students that are just giving me super quizzical looks. And then I say, oh, or, or if you ever begged your mom for that cool lollipop at the, the store that looked like it was all crystallized and hard. And, and of course, these are the images that are in my brain. And Amanda has even gotten ahead of me and she actually brings the rock candy to class, right? So Amanda, you were way smarter than me. I was just sort of riffing off of this, uh, this idea I had in my head. But of course, I'm verbally describing this to the students. Um, you know, or, you know, if I had gotten a little more clever, I could bring some rock candy to class or, or bring some of these images to class. Um, but I also, as I described it to students, I was started to think about how, like, this really was something that could now be tangible. And so I said, oh, I should have made some to bring to class. And of course, all my students are like, oh, yeah, Siller, you should have brought some, uh, probably because they wanted to eat it, but also, of course, because they wanted some tangibility of there, I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> and so, uh, this is where this idea came from, that I wanted to represent this. And so, of course, my first idea was to just buy some and bring it to class. Um, but I started to think about how if I just bought some that might be represented by this image on the left here that you can see, um, we create some even more problems. And so I'm hoping in the chat right now, I'd really be curious to see who's already tearing apart this analogy that I'm showing here in either representation, whether just bringing the lollipops to class that are shown on the left or making the rock candy myself um, to bring from home. Wh where do you think students could go in sort of really weird directions or where the analogy is not so great? Oh, and this is gonna be like class with my students where I have to like sit and pause, kill some time while someone types into the chat. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, okay, so rock candy requires some evaporation. Oh, our fibers aren't connected to each other. We just have like standalone fibers. Yeah, I think that definitely 
our analogy is not super great there. Anything else? The three-dimensional structure is not really clear here. <laughs> Can rock candy go backwards and get smaller? Ooh, Wendy, I like it. Yeah, I mean, I guess it could if you ate some of it. Ooh, yeah, Juno. Um, yeah, we're not, I mean, we haven't even gotten to this level of oppositional growth. And I also think that there could be some scale problems maybe that could get confused here. I also... Oh, some lace. Oh my gosh, you guys, you have some great ideas. Uh, I also really don't like the stick in the um, the lollipop side here that we've got just because it's um, not showing us that collagen is a little bendy right before we um, encrust it with those salts. That stick is just definitely way too um, hard and, and firm to me, I think. Okay, so with that in mind, I will tell you that one other... Oh yeah, the sugar crystals are pretty brittle. And I guess maybe we could go there in a good way, right? And talking about the, the brittleness of those sugar crystals. One more thing that was bothering me was the use of sugar. I have to say, I really didn't want ever, you can imagine the horror of some students beginning to think somehow that there was sugar that was part of that, that um, what was encrusting to make bone, actual bone. And so this is where I sort of was trying to think about how do I take this representation and how do I make it a better analogy for my students if I'm going to go through the effort of making it and bring it in. Of course, I was thought about what did I want to represent. I definitely wanted to represent the collagen fibers of the osteoid. I wanted them to be somewhat flexible. I wanted it to be multiple fibers twisted on each other so that we could begin to sort of see that there were micro spaces in in between the fibers that were available um, to, to really uh, provide a place to seed the phosphate ions. Um, I also wanted that, that that to represent that that extracellular microenvironment is saturated, that we we need to create a situation in which there is an abundance of the, the ions uh, so that they will come out of solution and encrust and become mineral salts. And you can see here this uh, beginning of a representation of that. Um, uh, one thing I forgot to put on here that I definitely did want to represent is that this, um, we're talking about a version of salts, right? That we're talking about ions. Um, and so I wanted to use salt and not sugar uh, to represent this. So I'm now going to get to the, what we might call the ta-da moment, the recipe itself. And I have to tell you at this minute, when I was building this presentation, I felt like, mm, is, this, is this too simple? Is this too like um, arts and craftsy? But then I was also thinking about like, this is kind of the whole point is that I wanted something that was easy to do, easy to do for myself so that I didn't have to harass my lab techs who are sometimes operating at like, a threshold capacity um, to do all the other things that we're asking them to do to help us prep our labs. Um, and I also, as I thought about sharing this with others, I didn't want to share something where I was like, mm, go get this fancy stuff from your fancy lab. Because, you know, at our community college, we have a decent lab, but it's not very fancy. And I think there are a lot of folks who have uh, fewer resources than we do, um, or just are not interested in constantly accessing the resources they have for every little demo that they want to do with their students. So here is my recipe, and some of you are probably already reading through this as I'm ch chatting here with you, um, but we need some uh, cotton string, and the, the cotton there is pretty important. I'll, I'll show you something in a, in a minute about why I'm particularly calling that out. Um, and I didn't say it here, but it definitely needs to be a multi multiply, right? So it needs to have more than one cotton piece that's twisted. Uh, you need some sort of stick or stirrer to hang the string. Uh, my lab techs actually found me some really cool um, tongue depressors with the hole down the middle. I'm sure there's a fancy name for them uh, that I was super excited about. So I did use that, but you could, of course, just use a plain wooden stirrer or whatever you have on hand that will span um, the top of whatever beaker you choose to use. And you need a salt. Uh, I've given you lots of options here. The one I'm choosing to show you images of is made with kosher salt because again, I was sort of searching for the what would be the one 
one of the ones that we could easily grab off of a grocery store shelf if we don't have access to some of the fancier ones. Um, I really do want to chase down some of the other ones that my lab techs have. I honestly have not yet. So um, you all are welcome to do that uh, and, and let me know how it goes. Uh, and then, of course, you want some water. And the gist of it is, is that you're going to heat your water to boiling, dissolve the salt in the water until you can't dissolve any more in at boiling. And then um, you're going to hang your string in it and wait uh, about two to seven days. I will tell you, I've written out a more involved recipe at the end of this slide deck. So for those of you that might be madly scribbling right now, it's in the slide deck. Um, and I think Adam has already said uh, this before, but the slide deck will be emailed to you after the presentation. So you will be getting the slide deck, which has the involved recipe. I'll show it to you at the end so you can see where it is in the order of things. Um, so right now I am curious, and this is uh, another question that I think uh, going into the Q&A is just fine. If there are any questions about the, the nuts and bolts, the logistics of just brewing this thing up before we get into presenting it to our students, um, questions about just how it gets done. Adam, are there any uh, folks pop posting anything in the Q&A? Not yet. <laughs> you are doing a, a great job being very clear here. So um, uh, if there is anything, I will uh, definitely let you know. But right now, it seems we're in the clear. Okay. Thanks, Adam. You know, it's okay. always that funny thing. I'm sure many of you experience this, that when there are no questions, you have to wonder, is it because I'm so amazing? Or is it because someone hasn't had a chance to speak up yet? Or is it something else entirely? So I have a feeling maybe there's questions brewing in the back of your head and maybe um, you're not quite sure what it is yet. So um, we can definitely move on. And Adam, please feel free to interrupt me if something um, pops into that Q&A that you feel like um, is relevant and time worthy. We just had a few uh, So So um, Carolyn mentions doing this with sugar would produce a uh, faster result. Yes, uh, I really wish I could make this edible. <laughs> yeah, I agree that the edible part could have a lot of appeal for the students. You definitely don't want to be feeding them this salt version. Um, when I have attempted to make this with my kids in the past, and I even tried it again in the lab here, I found that I could not get good encrusting. And honestly, I was talking with a colleague and saying, I don't know how they make those lollipops because I could not get really beautiful crystals from my sugar solutions. It could be that I was not, I was just using tables, um, I almost said table salt. I was using um, sucrose table sugar and I couldn't get it. Uh, so maybe yes, maybe no. Any other questions? And there was one more that, uh, oh, hold on. I think I, uh, nope, never mind. I read that wrong. We are good to go. And Anya says she did it with her kids. I'm assuming you mean the, the sugar version and it took a few days, but you got good crystallization. It could be an um, environment. Like it's, uh, I don't know, it's pretty humid here. I don't know if that is it. I, you know, it, who knows? There could be a lot of things. I honestly didn't chase it down very far when I wasn't getting good crystallization with the sugar um, it sort of validated going with the salt, at least for my particular environment and the um, what we've been having uh, around here. So let's go ahead and take that and say, all right, we've done this, we've brewed it up. Um, you can see I said two to seven days. Um, at two days, I had kind of meager crystallization. And then in this slide here, you can see this is about what I had after five days. Um, and I went ahead and just did the simplest version of this for you all at, um, to take these photographs because I kind of wanted to just show you, okay, if we just bare bones it, and you can see that there's still some things about this analogy that are still not, um, still creating problems that some of you pointed out with even the, the sugar analogy we thought about earlier. Um, but I, I liked just saying, okay, if we just did this in the simplest version that we could, what would we get? And so... Um, ooh, Terry, I, I like your idea there. So as a demonstration, here is what I do in my class. I, I, I make my recipe and then I hang several strings so that I've got, I, I usually sort of think my classes are 24 students large and in the lab they sit at tables of four. So I think I was sort of thinking sets of six. So I'll make six of these little encrusted um, strings that you can see here in this image to the left. 
And then I'll also cut up some um, little sections, you know, like, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 centimeter long, four inch long um, sections of just plain string, uh, six of them, and then some little containers or piles of uh, kosher salt. Uh, that's right, I forgot. The other reason I like the kosher salt is because it's pretty, um, like it's not as tiny as table salt is. And so as I'm giving it to the students and we're talking about it, they, they can actually kind of see some of the crystals even in just the salt on its own. And I pass uh, these three items around so that each table has these. If you're in a classroom, you may choose to not pass the salt around depending upon how much of a mess you want to make. But the string and these little um, pre-made little um, representations of the encrusted string are pretty easy to pass around. And I give them to my students and I just ask them to look at them and we talk about what the components are representing and um, and and how that action has happened, how I created the recipe, honestly, talking about um, making sure that I had saturated my, my water with um, salt uh, to represent the way the osteoblasts would do so in their in their own little microenvironment around them. So I'm hoping that you, all of you can see that this is like, as far as doing that, that's like pretty straightforward. You can do that. And if that's all that, that you have time for and you just want to use it as a quick analogy, um, this could go in a classroom, it could go in a lab, depending upon your, your time, but it can work pretty easily. Adam, I see you um, turned your microphone back on. Did we have another question? Yeah, we did have something, but I believe you may have kind of answered it. But the question was, I assume you might be uh, getting ready to say how this is implemented. So you make the recipe, students only see the result but not yes. the process, right? Exactly, which I think is not the best it could be, right? And so honestly, this kind of goes on how much how much time do I have? Um, I teach in the quarter system. And so some quarters have a few more days in them than others, depending upon what quarter it is in the time of year. And so there will be quarters where I'm like, oh, I have a whole extra day. And other quarters where I'm like, oh, I, I don't really have a lot of extra time. So you're right. Like this is just results. And like maybe we can talk about the cotton string representing the, the collagen fiber without anything uh, stuck to it. It's it's floppy. Um, but that's really kind of all we can get. And so what I really like to do is get a little further. And so I'm on this slide, I have some sort of critical thinking possibilities. And I'm going to share these with you and I'll share with you why I have them broken down um, into two sections here. And then um, I will go ahead and prime you that I'd really like to have a robust conversation about the other ways we could go, which I feel like some of you are already thinking of. Um, and we can, um, I think it's going to be easier to get it running in the chat just because we're going to have a lot of ideas. But if it starts to scroll too fast in the chat and you really feel like you've got a great idea that you want to have conversation about, then um, maybe the Q&A is the place to put it. So the top three items here, as far as critical thinking possibilities, I think that these could also be asked in that just demo level, that we could ask students um, why the salt stuck to the string more than the glass. Oh, I forgot to tell you that. That would have been helpful. I also, with the demo, often bring in one a setup where the, the, the whole setup is still um, with the string hanging into the liquid. Um, and they'll, what they'll see is that there's a little bit of salt encrusting the glass, but there is much more salt encrusting the string. And so I asked them to think about that and then they can tell me about why they think that's true. Um, and then the, the, pair, the next pair of questions I really like, I feel like they're useful with any analogy. Where does this analogy hold well for what's really happening? And um, in what ways is this analogy of poor representation? Kind of what we did with the sugar analogy earlier. It really helps students sort of dig down into thinking about what's actually happening versus the analogy. And of course, students really love to tear down an analogy where they can. And so I really like that um, that, that gives them the opportunity to do that. What I think it could be really fun though, is to use these three blue highlighted ones. And these would be ones where we are gonna let the students make the process happen themselves. Um, and so we could ask students to construct a representation that gets us to an osteoblast becoming an osteocyte in a lacuna. And this is something folks brought up earlier with where the analogy fails is that it's, it's oversimplified. We just have one collagen fiber dangling here with uh, some salts encrusting it. 
um, which really doesn't get us to lacuna level of visualizing things. And so asking students to do that, I think students, I've not tried this yet. I really want to ask the students to do this. I've done it myself, but never let them just do the whole dig in. Um, they could have a lot of fun tying um, strings together in elaborate uh, renditions of how the fibers might be arranged around an osteoblast um, and then hang those into the a sugar or sorry, a salt solution and, and see what happens over a span of a year. Yeah, a year. Oh my gosh, a span of a week. How's that? Um, asking students to go ahead and represent rickets and osteomalacia. And just, I mean, I don't think that's really very complicated, but then thinking about, well, what does that mean, right? And then, of course, uh, we could get them to really go um, down a lot of different interesting avenues, have them go ahead and chase down what's osteogenesis imperfecta, what could we do to um, represent it, what kinds of materials would you need, I can get those for you, that kind of thing. Uh, and I, I want to talk to you about this image that I'm showing you here, because it has to do with that chasing down the osteogenesis imperfecta, one of the ways that you could help students do that with materials that you might have on hand. Um, in this image on the right, we've got the cotton string that's gotten encrusted with the salts. On the left, that pink string is a nylon string hung into the salty water for the same period of time. And you can see how there's a lot less encrusting on it, which is a, a bit of a dilemma. But what I wish I could show you is that um, that pink string has gotten very hard. And so as I try and bend that pink string, it, it cracks. And when I bend the cotton string, even within the, the crystalline structure there that you can see, there's some give to it. It's not very much, but there's a little bit of give there. And so I think that this could be a great way to help your students chase down what's happening in osteogenesis imperfecta in which the um, collagen fibers have been constructed incorrectly, the genes wrong, and so we're not building the collagen fibers correctly and either less is getting spewed out or it's not um, uh, arranging itself as it should once it is up in the extracellular matrix. And so we get salt, but the salt is out of balance with the string. Now, I know this analogy isn't perfect, but at least it gets you to that um, more fragile or more brittle setup that we see in osteogenesis imperfecta. So those are a couple possibilities. And now I'm really curious to hear um, what some of you have been thinking about as far as ways we could go. Um, I see that someone in the chat is asking about a super saturated calcium phosphate solution. Oh, I would love to see someone try that. I think that would be great. I've not tried that. And maybe we'll get even more beautiful crystals than we've got here. Adam, are there any, is there anything further coming in the Q and A or, or what do you see happening there? Nothing is coming into the Q and A. We do have some, uh things in chat as you get in. Yes. Yeah. Q and A. Okay. Fun. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Um, uh, Sabrina, I I also wonder, yeah, if we could if we could uh, get more elaborate and even get into that endochondral ossification and um, talking about the the cartilage getting replaced by bone. Wow, that could get really elaborate, but it could be fun to ask your students to think about how they might do it. Um, even if they if they can't come up with a a way to really represent it using the tools we have, the fact that you're getting to try and puzzle through what would and wouldn't work would probably get their brains to begin to churn on what's actually happening um, in an endochondral ossification. That could be kind of cool. Any other thoughts from folks about uh, places you could go with the, this start? Uh, Carolyn, you know, you've got some uh, great questions there, and I think probably, which is where I think this analogy sort of falls apart, because I don't really think that's the difference in what's happening with osteogenesis imperfecta. So I agree that like the nylon fiber should be useful for something to represent, but I'm not sure where it's great and where it's um, maybe creating more problems than it's solving. Other questions that folks might have. Well, I'll let you mull on that a little more. I'd really love to have some more back and forth, especially for folks that are sort of riffing off of 
um, where they feel like this analogy is still a little thin, that they might change it. Um, please don't hesitate to tell me you've got a better idea than I've got here, because I really think um, there's more that could be done with this. Um, I, I think as I look forward, I want to challenge my students more with the critical thinking stuff, because I think that sometimes the students are the best in going down the avenues of what, what might be representable here that I hadn't even thought about. Um, what I do want to show you are a couple of things in this slide deck, and then I think Adam is going to jump back in here, and then if we have any more Q&A, we'll come back to that. So if you've got other questions, um, please keep um, please feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, as I go forward here, I will show you that these are some of the sources I use, so this will be in that slide deck. And then the next slide that we've got here is that recipe that I promised you with a little more of some things that... Um, could be useful to help you out um, as you're building this for yourself and some sort of hints and things that I've learned along the way. Um, Adam, if you wanna go ahead and uh, share um, regarding this, um, the HAPS Partners Engage page. Sure thing, thank you, Hillary. So we'll be uh, posting the recording to the session and all other sessions of the series on this HAPS Partners Engage page. Um, and I just put it into chat for you all to bookmark if you wish. There's also more information about Cengage if you are curious and want to learn more. So thank you so much, Hillary. Thanks, Adam. Uh, and so I really hope that maybe there's a few more questions coming up because I made this really pretty Q&A page for y'all. And so I figured I'd throw that up there. I do have to say one of the places where I'm, I still feel like students, that there's a misconception that continues is on scaling, right? And so what we were trying to represent um, with this uh, with this analogy is really on a, a quite a tiny scale, right? We're on the protein, individual protein level and um, mineral salt level. And yet my fear is that students will begin to conflate that um, with spongy bone uh, because I see them already doing that sometimes when they're trying to sort of tell me things. They'll begin to want to tell me that those spaces that we see in the spongy bone on this slide are the lacunae um, because they sort of lost their sense of scale. So that is a, a bit of a dilemma that I haven't quite figured out how to solve. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that uh, or other questions that might have come up. Uh, we do see one last question that came in. Just want to make sure to mention also at the end of this session, uh, there will be a survey link for you to fill out upon closing out. So if you could take a few moments to fill us in, let us know what you thought of the session. This will help us to become better and uh, just know how to better uh, provide content for you in the future. So uh, we appreciate uh, the questions that are continuing to come in here. Uh, there's one that uh, I'm wondering how you would take this a step further to demo the process to show the matrix with the embedded bone cells. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think that we might have to think about something that we could tuck in to a lacuna that we crafted out of this, right? So that we could tuck an osteocyte into the lacuna and then talk about how that osteocyte continues to manage the extracellular matrix around itself. I think there's there's opportunity there. I don't know, a grape? <laughs> I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking of the things that would be the, that you could really sort of craft a lacuna around that you could then see. Um, I, I'm concerned that anything that you tucked in there on the front end of, of letting that encrusting happen is also going to get encrusted. And of course, we don't want students to think that the cells themselves are going to get hardened and covered in those mineral salts. So um, that might be a little tricky to figure out how to get a, a cell in there after the fact a little bit. Um, I did see a, a, a thought from Tracy about soaking chicken bones in vinegar and having students model the chemistry with those materials. I think that that is a great idea. I think that's a great way for them to sort of think of that, that larger scale again of um, if we can get some of the calcium salts out, what do we have left behind? Um, and, and what does that render for our bone? I think that um, that analogy can be really great for representing rickets as well, because if we can get the mineral salts away, then students can see how much, how the bones have too much give, too much bend, which then as the body weight stresses those bones, they begin to bow out as we see in rickets. 
<laughs> yeah, a gross idea with the bones, but uh, also, um, yeah, makes makes a great uh, representation uh, for students, definitely. Um, Adam, I don't know um, if there's a good way to answer Elizabeth's question there. I, Elizabeth, I'm guessing that perhaps uh, when we send you the materials at the end, I don't know, Adam, if you have a better answer. Yeah, we could follow up with our events team about that and see uh, what we can, we might be able to do. Okay, great. Oh, bleach will digest the collagen, so you can do the the osteogenesis imperfecta and the rickets uh, with your chicken bones by putting them in different solutions. That's really cool. Great, thank you for sharing that, Trish. Or oh, retire into osteocytes within a lacuna or a little lake house. Oh my gosh, Travis, that's that's great. I think we'd all like to retire to little lake houses. <laughs> Yes, and Alexander, that's another option um, to uh, uh, take care of getting rid of the collagen to make them more brittle is to bake them instead of soaking them in bleach. So um, multiple options there for doing that on that larger scale. I think pairing that activity with something like this so you can help students sort of compare the scale, scale they're at would probably be super great. Well, thank you all for a robust uh, discussion and conversation. I am really excited to hear from many of you, maybe in some of uh, these HAPS events as we go forward and I see you, please tell me what you've done. Um, I'm really curious to see how you've run with this and made it something even better. So thank you all for a fabulous uh, uh, activity together today.